St. Mark United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you've chosen to be here this morning. A uh, special welcome to guests who are here with us today. Uh, if you will, uh, a reminder after the service, introduce yourself to an usher or greeter. We have a gift to share with you and some information about life here in the family of faith at St. Mark. Uh, if you ever want to take a blue care card from the uh, pew in front of you and share your presence with us, those go in the uh, bags when the offering plates come by later on in the service. A couple of things to highlight. This week's Wednesday night supper uh, beginning at 5.30, a special Wednesday night, some staff birthdays to celebrate. Uh, if you bring a homemade baked something for dessert to celebrate the birthdays, it's 
It's Jody's birthday and it's Amy's birthday, and they fall together at this time. So if you bring a home-baked dessert, you get dinner free for your family, uh, and then they'll judge the products of, uh, of your baking and make a, a kind of a fun night for Wednesday night supper this week. Put that on your, uh, on your calendar, either to bake or to come. Uh, a reminder, it's time to register for summer children's camp. Our children's camp is the last week in June. If you have a child or grandchild that's not yet registered, spots are filling up quickly. Uh, do that by picking up a, uh, a registration form in the office or uh, easier by going online to the St. Mark website. And there's a link there to an online registration form. You can do it that way. Uh, also a reminder, next Sunday after this worship service, our St. Mark 101 will gather. Uh, for anyone who's interested in knowing more about life as a follower of Jesus here at St. Mark, uh, time to come and learn and make a decision perhaps about whether you want to join us in membership. Uh, St. Mark 101, make your reservations or, or just show up next week after the worship service over in the office uh, conference room. Stand now and greet those around you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
our prayers together we continue to worship him and give glory and honor to his name i'll remind you that our altar is open if you want to come and kneel uh, in that way signal the joining of your heart with ours as we pray together this morning uh, from our congregation several concerns to remember uh, donald davis uh, recovering after surgery alfreda watson uh, in a hospitalization uh, also just this morning uh, gene wells father uh, gene wells senior uh, admitted to the hospital uh, remembering those with procedures coming up, Nancy Snoots and Kay Gorday. Uh, remembering Jerry Averill at home, still recovering with some complications after surgery a week ago. And Shirley Williamson's mother, Dorothy Gibson. Uh, Ms. Gibson has been at the Columbus Hospice House this week for respite care and will be returning home uh, this week. So remember Shirley as they uh, care for her and find the right balance of caring for her at home in this time. Let's go together to the Lord, first in silence and then as we pray together. <clears throat> Father, this morning we pray together using the words of the psalm, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. We will declare that your love stands firm forever and that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Oh God, this morning as we bow our heads and as we bow our hearts to come into your presence, we acknowledge the greatness of your love that endures forever. Oh God, we acknowledge that as a statement of our past and as a statement of our hope for the future. For we come this morning from different places. We come, many of us, fully aware of 
the way that your love has been shown to us, how we have experienced your love in the last week. And Father, we come to from places, some of us, where our memory of your love has been stretched. And in our uncertainty and in our fear, we have perhaps found ourselves doubting your goodness and your presence. Oh God, this morning, may we proclaim again, whether by knowledge and by certainty or whether simply by faith and by hope, we will say again, oh God, your great love is forever. And it will be firm and it will be established. It is established in the heaven and we'll wait patiently and we'll work cooperatively with you and with your grace that your love might be established in our hearts and in our lives again. For we confess, God, we confess that we are too quick to forget. We're too quick to assume we know best, too quick to walk away from the wisdom of Scripture and the wisdom of the church's tradition. And when when we find ourselves wandering We're too quick to blame you instead of owning our own rebelliousness before you. Oh God, today we give you thanks that you have made known your great love through the actions and the words of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. We're thankful that in his death on the cross, He showed for us the full measure of your love as he purchased us back for you. And as his resurrection proves your seal of approval on him, it also proves your seal of forgiveness on each of us. That there is a possibility for us for new life and for new hope, for new faithfulness as you work your faithfulness into our faithfulness. Oh God, this morning we acknowledge our concerns before you. Some of them we've named before you. Persons and families who need a particular awareness of your grace and your healing in their lives. Father, others of us come giving thanks and yet seeking other answers, seeking other reminders. And just as Jesus brought freedom to those who were held captive, may we find freedom. And just as Jesus touched and gave healing to those who were not whole, may we find wholeness. And just as Jesus welcomed and ate with sinners, May we find our own welcome through the grace and the mercy you've shown us in Jesus Christ. Teach us to find his way as we pray together using his words, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
can have the children join me down front for our time together. Yesterday, we went to Gigi's Cupcakes. I don't know if some of you have been over there yet, but um, we had this very hard conversation. Do we get the box of minis, because really only need a little bit, you know, and that'll break up, or do we all get one big one together? And so I made the crazy suggestion to Mr. Shannon that maybe he and I should split a big one. And do you, I said, do you want to share it? And he said, uh, no. <laughs> because they're really good. They're really, really good. The icing is as thick as the cake. They're good stuff, right? And so Mr. Shannon, he's not a selfish guy. He just, you know, they're really good. And so he knew if he shared, there wouldn't be enough goodness uh, for him. So he just wanted double the goodness, which I don't blame him for that, right? You know, we talk a lot about sharing, don't we? Do your parents say share ever? Yeah, you've been told to share your toys. You've probably been told um, to share maybe some food at some point. Um, maybe you've been, you've had to share a friend and that's kind of hard, you know, because we have our best friends and then we have to share them with somebody else. So it's hard to share. But as I started to think about sharing, I thought, you know what? There's only one thing that I can think of that if I share it, then there's still enough of it for me to get all the yummy goodness like Mr. Shannon wanted, right? And the other person to get just as much goodness. I wonder what that could be. What is that? What do you think? Jesus, it really is. You know, his love is so big and so great that it's something that I can have and I can feel so much love from him, but I can give that love to somebody else and they feel it just as much and then that person can give it to somebody and they feel it just as much and you can share and it's almost like it gets bigger and bigger the more you share it as opposed to smaller than what we're used to. And that's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? You know, after Easter, when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, he came back and he said to his disciples, he said, there's, there's a couple of things I, I want you to do. And one of those was I want you to go out and I want you to share me. I want you to share my love with people. So y'all think y'all can do that this week? Y'all think y'all can do that for me and for Jesus? Yeah. Well, let's say a prayer together and thank him for it. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you're big enough to share. Help us to love others and to love you this week. Amen. You guys can head to Children's Church in Praise Land. Father, you really are a big and great and wonderful God and so generous with us. And as we come now to give back to you, we pray that you would stir in us a generosity so that others would hear your name and that these tithes and offerings would be blessed. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Bibles this morning to John chapter 21. It's page 574 in the Red Pew Bibles. John chapter 21. It has happened to me this week. I, I've already, I'm already so over all this construction on Whittlesea Boulevard down here. How, how about in the rest of you? If you, if you drive this thing back and forth, and they say, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that they're going to wait until they get that completely finished, and then they're going to start on Whitesville Road. Probably they won't do that like together. They'll wait until they're completely. And, and I, I was going down Whitesville Road uh, in, into all this this mess one day this week and, and I did what you've done before traffic was moving it started moving and then it stopped and it started and, and I was starting to move with the traffic and I was happy that finally traffic was moving and, and then suddenly it's sort of a, a reflection or something in my rearview mirror made me have the feeling that something was coming up really close behind me and so I, I turned my attention to my rearview mirror and it, it wasn't as close as I felt it was and then suddenly I looked back and I was closer <laughs> I didn't hit anybody, don't worry. No ticket, no, no nothing, no, no, it was a, a near miss, a, a near miss. But I realized what, what we often realize, when we, when we look back, when we look back for, for too long, and looking back is sometimes necessary, but when we look back for too long, we often make mistakes that hinder us in our ability to go forward. As we look at the last part of John's gospel, uh, as we look at the, the, the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection, I, I find it amazing that we don't go back every time and, and revisit the, uh, the resurrection itself. Easter is settled. The resurrection is settled. Jesus is not appearing time and time and time again to his disciples so that they get the fact that he really is alive. He's alive and that's settled. He's appearing again and again and again, telling them, follow me. Keep looking ahead, follow me. And this morning as we look at this third resurrection appearance of Jesus in John chapter 21, I want us to remind ourselves, I want us to hear from Jesus as to how he wants to come and gain our attention wherever we are so that we can recognize the abundance he provides and then become the kind of attractive people, attracted to him and then attractive for him and for his sake in the world in which we live. Let's look at John chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples, this time by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now, now, if I'm counting right, that's only seven. There should have been 11. Judas, you remember, had kind of gone his own way, but there should be 11. I'm not sure what happened to the other four, but this is only seven of them anyway gathered together. I'm going out to fish, in verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did that, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples then followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread prepared. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. And so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, and he dragged that net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And so Jesus came, and he took the bread, and he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him this third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. Let's pray together. Oh God, we cannot live by bread alone. We live by every word which comes from your mouth. Open today our ears and our minds and our hearts that we can receive your living word who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful this morning, uh, coming back into worship a couple of Sundays after Easter, I'm thankful for a deep bench, right? You know what that means in sports, a deep bench. I'm thankful. Uh, I'm thankful both for Amy's uh, proclamation of the gospel, for preaching last week, and I'm thankful uh, for all the good things that I've heard from you about it. It made me a little bit nervous to come back in the pulpit this week. I, I haven't, i got to confess, I haven't had time to sit down and watch the YouTube clip, uh, watch the YouTube uh, upload uh, to hear all of, of the ways God blessed. But uh, that's a reminder to all of us, if you miss a Sunday here at St. Mark, uh, go online after a day, and the, the whole worship service, you can hear uh, the choir, you can hear the sermon again, or if you if you missed something while you were here and you kind of dove, well, watch it again as a chance to do that. Uh, speaking of the choir and, and deep bench, you'll know, you know Shirley Williamson, our, our, our organist, her mother's been ill, and uh, so we've had kind of flip and flop. We have, we've got a deep bench. David moves over to the organ, and then Pam Bailey comes over here, and you even get you even get Ken with a solo. What, what was that about? That was a, that was a surprise. That was a surprise to me at 8:30. Ken Ken was out this, at 8:30. He's he, I think back at, at 11. But thanks to, thanks to our deep bench and the youth. Uh, John chapter 21, this is looking ahead. This is, this is not a, 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 a rehash of the resurrection, but it is Jesus appearing again to prepare his disciples and to prepare us, as we read, as we listen in on these stories, it's preparing us to go forward and to follow Jesus. And first, we see this question of attention. What will capture their attention and what will capture our attention? Several of the disciples have gathered. Peter is, uh, is even here, even at this uh, early stage, Peter is uh, the, 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 the unabashed leader of this group. He's gathered them together. They're at the Sea of Galilee. They're probably in the town of Capernaum. Uh, that's the town that was Peter's hometown. It was the town that was uh, the home base for Jesus' three years of traveling ministry in the, in the north of Israel. They've gone back to Capernaum. They've gone back to what they know. Peter and many of the other disciples... At least Peter and his brother Andrew, at least James and John, and perhaps some of the others, they were fishermen, uh, not simply by hobby, uh, not simply by, by something they liked to do on, on Friday evening or on Saturdays, the weekends. Uh, they were fishermen by trade. This was their livelihood. It's what they had done best for the most of their lives. They had gone back to what they knew. They had gone back to fish again. Simon Peter says it. I don't know what you guys are doing. I don't know what all of us are supposed to be doing even. He sort of admits his weakness at this point. But I'm going fishing. And everybody says, well, that sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, there's a lot that's been written about this verse and, and about Peter and the disciples' decision to go fishing. And, and some of it is sort of dismissing. Uh, like uh, Peter and, and, and the others, like they had missed their calling. Like they had missed what Jesus wanted from them. They were supposed to be already proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the good news. And instead, they were just sitting around doing nothing. I, I think this, though, I, I think it's always a good choice to do what you know how to do when what you know how to do is good. It's always a good choice to do what you know how to do when what you know how to do is good. I think even in this moment, in this little insight into, into Peter and the disciples' lives, there is a continued blessing of the idea that all of us as Christians, we have a vocation. We have a calling to reflect Jesus in all we do. But we also have a location in which we live out our vocation. We have a location, and for many, for, for most of us, for most of us, that's in a place of work that is not that is not professional, that is not paid, that's not professional Christian. Uh, Peter wasn't yet about the business of being a full-time apostle, a full-time preacher or evangelist or church planner. Peter was about working for God and letting God's call be worked out right where he was living. 
this is a blessing of the idea of vocation and that God's call is present in whatever we do and whatever we do well and whatever we do with joy. Even if we look back at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we'll be reminded that work, that work, at least as God intended it, our work was not a curse. Our work, we were not supposed to dread Monday morning. I mean, that, that, that question, uh, Paul, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, uh, as to how many of you dread uh, going to bed Sunday night because you know what's going to come on Monday morning or when the alarm clock is going to ring. No, that's just it. I said, don't raise your hand. You're giving yourself away. Somebody report him to his supervisor. I'll tell you that. Work as God intended it. Work as God intended it was a part of, of the rhythm of life. And God gave Adam and Eve a responsibility to till the earth, to work the earth, and to bring forth the great fruitfulness that was there. Our work, when we do it well, is a reflection and a continuation of Adam and Eve's work. But just as sin separated Adam and Eve from God, sin separated us from the idea that we can be satisfied in being obedient to God and living out the fullness of our vocation. I mean, think about the ways that we choose what we do. Well, we use our reason. Uh, God has created us in his image, the Bible says. Even though we are fallen and sinful, there is still a, a, a residue, a remainder of, of, of divine reason that works in our minds. You, you look around and you say, well, some people more than others. But, but our reason we can use to figure out what gifts we have, what abilities we have, and how we can make ourselves useful and productive in the world. We pursue also our, our sense of righteousness, the presence of Christ in our lives, the gift of Christ to make us holy. And so in making us holy, make us reflective of, of God's presence wherever we are. God leads us also to discern the rhythm of life. So our vocation, it not only involves our reason or our sense of God's righteousness being worked out, but there's a rhythm. Uh, even for Simon Peter and for the other six that are gathered with him, uh, what, did, what did the writer of the, Ecclesi uh, the Ecclesiastes say? The writer of Ecclesiastes says, there's a time and a season for this and there's a time for that. So we see for Peter, there's a time for work and a time for rest. There's a time for, uh, uh, for planning and a time for doing, a time for thinking and a time for acting. So we see even in, in Peter's uh, and the disciples, their action right here, we see a sense of the rhythm of creation, a time for Sabbath perhaps and a time for working. Peter here has reclaimed perhaps his first vocation as a true uh, literal fisherman on the way toward finding his second vocation, being a fisher of men. And, and this perhaps was a necessary path that he had to take, and maybe it's even a path that we all have to take. A path of being assured in our first vocation so that we can find a way to live out God's grace in the second vocation, which is to reflect the life of Jesus in our actions. Uh, John's picture uh, of this story is so beautiful because they go out to fish at night, and that's a reality of first century fishing on the Sea of Galilee, that they would go, and the primary fishing was at night. But in John's gospel, night symbolizes darkness, it symbolizes separation from God's purposes. And so in the early hours of the morning, as their attention is first on their work, as their hearts are settled by their work, they're open then to seeing the light of the dawning of Jesus Christ coming. Ultimate satisfaction, while there is a measure of satisfaction in work done well, ultimate satisfaction is not in work, ultimate satisfaction is in attention on Jesus Christ. Good work provides a place. Satisfying work provides a place for Jesus to come and focus our attention on him. Note how they, they realize who it is there. He calls out to them. They're only a hundred yards away. They were with Jesus for three years. They should have recognized him, but they didn't. They didn't. Perhaps they were distracted in that time. And so there was a gradual realization for us, for many of us, there's a gradual realization. Wait a minute, I can find Jesus at work where I work. And so our attention can go from what we're working on to who is working in us. Attention moves to Jesus Christ. It's the Lord, one of them says, and the rest of them look up. How did we not recognize that? It is the Lord, it is the Lord. And, and they respond, not simply to his word or to his calling, but they respond because the presence of the Lord, as his attention, as their attention shifts to Jesus, their attention, they realize there is a true abundance in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
abundance. What was the count? 153 fish. We'll talk about that in a minute. There was an abundance. Where Jesus was, there was an abundance. Now, this is not, you'll have to tune uh, your televisions to get the false gospel of prosperity. I won't give you that here because it's not a true gospel. But there, <laughs> that God's always going to bless you financially. It's not like, uh, I think it was Janis Joplin that sang, Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Some of you remember that. My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Work hard all my life. No help from my friends. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? No, that's not a prayer <laughs> that God will answer or that God will honor. That's not his purpose in our lives. But in the person of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, there is great abundance. And the great abundance is that, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is abundance in my life and in your life. Uh, again, looking at John's whole gospel, Jesus' first appearance Jesus' first public miracle in John's gospel, recorded in the second chapter, is to come into a wedding, and, and, and I don't know, due to poor planning or maybe more guests than they had anticipated, the wedding, they run out of wine, maybe, maybe you know this story, and so Jesus, his first public miracle is not a healing, his first public miracle is to take water and to make it into wine so that this wedding can go on and so it can be a jubilant and joyful celebration. Jesus' presence means abundance, abundance of wine, abundance of joy. Maybe you remember this story better. Some 5,000 men had gathered on the hillside along with their wives and children to hear Jesus teach. Nobody bothered to pack a lunch, and they were not near, uh, with, they didn't have cell service to call in a caterer. And, and so they, they, they said, well, only a few people, one person maybe brought some bread and some fish. And Jesus prayed over that. And the presence of Jesus brought abundance, right? Bread and fish enough that they could collect the leftovers, and the leftovers were enough to feed another whole crowd. The presence of Jesus is abundance. And so Jesus invites uh, uh, Peter and those others to consider the abundance of his presence. When Jesus comes, the story says they've been out fishing all night long and their nets are still empty. When Jesus comes and Jesus says, throw your nets on the other side these guys were professional fishermen they knew all the tricks of the trade they didn't need somebody on the shore sort of like a monday morning quarterback saying uh, this is what you should have done or could have done but somehow they responded to that invitation they responded to the invitation that says you don't have anything and sometimes it takes being in a place all night fishing and you have nothing to respond to that invitation to find abundance in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, put your nets on the other side, and they put their nets in, and they're suddenly full, almost to the point of breaking, and then they look up and realize, wait, they, 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 they connected the dots. We know abundance, and this is abundance. We've never experienced abundance like this, apart from, wait a minute, it's Jesus. Abundance, the invitation, when we are finally empty enough to hear his invitation, to throw out our nets, to open our hearts, to open our lives, and receive the presence, the person of Jesus Christ. Then we can find abundance. Where do we find abundance in Jesus Christ? We find it personally and individually as we seek God in the scriptures or in prayer. Uh, we find the presence of Jesus Christ as we worship together corporately as we're gathered here, especially as we, as we remember the sacraments, the, uh, the blessing of Christ in baptism. For his presence in the wine and in the bread of Holy Communion, special ways that we know and hone in and, and celebrate the abundant presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. Abundance can throw us for a loop. It throws Peter. Peter says, wait, it's him. And they're only 100 yards out, and they've got all these fish, and he, he abandons everybody else, and he, he doesn't even know what to do. He, he, he's been fishing, and to get comfortable, he's taken his outer garment off, and, you know, these robes or things. He's taken the outer garment off, and so he wants to jump in the water and swim to Jesus. And then first, wait a minute, he puts his clothes back on before he jumps in the water? What, 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 what does that do? He should have just jumped right in and then gotten his dry clothes once the boat came in. He doesn't know, and we don't know often when we encounter the abundance of Jesus Christ. Uh, there, there should be a lot of grace extended in the family of faith, when someone, uh, especially when someone for the first time encounters the abundant grace of Jesus Christ. Because they're not, well, well trained, right, like some of you are, right? You've been around long enough. You've been tamed or trained in how you respond to the presence of God. Maybe we need to be untamed or untrained.
But sometimes those first responding to the abundant presence of Jesus Christ can be impetuous or impulsive. That's not the point of this story, though. The point is that God, that, that Jesus transforms his disciples and takes them on a journey from experiencing abundance for themselves so that their abundant lives would then become attractive to others, so that Jesus would be the fundamental attraction of their lives. Much has been made about the 153 fish, this great uh, catch, a, a reminder a reminder of Peter and the disciples going from their first vocation, fishing for fish, to their second vocation, fishing for people, attracting people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 153, uh, a miracle in itself that the, that the nets don't, uh, don't give way, don't break. Uh, details there, maybe that just is the memory of, of John or James or one of these disciples who, who took the time to remember, just like you have special memories of who was present or what was going on at a special time in your life. They so remember this moment that they scanned the nets and did a quick count. That's what they did for a living. They could count fish, and they remembered and recorded that there are 153. Some scholars uh, point to the fact that this could be a symbolic, just a, a large number to remind us that all people of all nations or many people of many nations will eventually be drawn to Jesus Christ through the witness of the apostles and all of us who follow after them. Uh, there's also a connection to other places in John's gospel. Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. I will draw all people to myself when I am lifted up, when I am crucified and then resurrected. That same word, I will draw, is the same word when Peter is drawing this net in, hauling this net in, and, and they're pulling it to the shore. Jesus says, I will attract people to myself. I will attract people. The mercy that God is showing the world through me, through Jesus Christ, I will attract all people to myself. And so Peter shows us what it is to live a life that is attention, with attention set on Jesus and on the abundance that he provides so that life can be attractive. And what is the most attractive? A life of one whose attention is on Christ and who is living out the abundance of his blessings. An obedient life is an attractive life. An obedient life is an attractive life. Uh, truth be told, abundance sometimes helps us in our ministry to be attractive towards others. Uh, think about ministries at St. Mark where you are involved, Sunday school classes or Bible studies. Uh, the way that your life is impacted by being in fellowship with other Christians, that makes you, it shapes you, it makes you more like Jesus and it makes your life attractive to others so that others will be drawn towards Jesus in you. I'm excited about a new opportunity for ministry. We have a uh, Valley Interfaith Partnership. We're, we're, we're connecting with that. Maybe you've read about it on your bulletin, a chance that we as a, as a church will be able to offer even our physical building and our presence, our hospitality, the presence of God's abundance living in us welcoming families who are struggling through a time of temporary homelessness. Uh, there'll be more ahead about ways that we can partner with that ministry. But there is a provision, not just a, a physical provision there, but there is a provision and an invitation to the very presence of Jesus Christ. And friends, the, the, the presence of Jesus Christ is what's attractive in any church or in the life of any Christian believer. It's not the way we can say things or the way we can do things. It is the presence of Jesus Christ that makes our lives or our church attractive. Attention to Jesus Christ. Abundance, the abundance of his very real presence. And then the attractiveness of our lives filled with his presence. That's the new work. That is what is ahead for us as the sons and daughters of Easter. And Jesus is still calling us, saying, follow us. Let's pray together today. Oh God, we're thankful for the places that you have put us in our lives. Give us the grace to stay where we are and to be attentive to our work and to the work of Jesus Christ in us. That we might know the abundance of his presence, that our lives being transformed would be attractive. And we might draw others to you for your sake.
taking his grace and his abundance wherever you go. Go in peace and enjoy. Amen.